Now, once we do that, let's, our job, as we're on, I, I now pronounce you all economic theorists, our job as economic theorists is to think through how is the world going to work when the fiscal constraints are tougher, and so that consideration, that valuation equation, is really with us to try to, um, uh, is really with us in determining the price level. Well, when that is true, when that equation has force, it looks very simple. It kind of looks like MV equals PY. We've got a kind of different M and a different P and so forth. But many of the classic doctrines that you all have learned are false or overturned or at least different. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, one is particularly important. Remember what central banks do, they do not print money and hand it out. We often say the central bank controls money or prints money, but they don't. All a central bank can ever do is an open market operation. They, they buy government debt and give you money in exchange. So it's always buy one thing, give you another, or to, to lower the money supply, they have to take in money and give you government debt. That's all a central bank does. It does not print money. Well, let's look at our equation. Money and it's aim right, boom. Wait for the plane. Money and government debt enter symmetrically. If the government exchanges money for government debt, it doesn't change anything in this equation. So when this is working, open market operations, quantitative easing, have no effect at all on inflation. That's a surprise. Another surprise, what matters here are the claims the government has issued and promises to pay back. It's, it's government money that matters. Inside money doesn't matter. You've been taught a lot in, in monetary economics what it matters that the government controls bank deposits. It no more matters here if, if, if I issue to Pedro a promise to pay euros. The European Central Bank doesn't care about that because absent too big to fail and all that stuff, it's not on the hook for this. It, that doesn't expand the government's claims at all. So inside money doesn't matter. We usually think it matters a lot. Um, all sorts of doctrines are considered sins in monetary economics. Um, many central banks say, oh, we just provide money passively, we provide liquidity to the markets, we peg interest rates, uh, we follow a real bills doctrine where we just, if people bring us private debt, we give them government debt. All of these things are, are sins in the classical way of thinking of things because they leave the price level completely indeterminate. They don't control the M. But that doesn't matter here whatsoever. Um, all of these things still lead to a determinate price level if, if that's what's uh, running the price level. Um, now, the central bank still has a role. The central bank can still set interest rates. And now, uh, I needed T subscripts. I didn't want to do a fancy equation, but those of you who are used to fancy equations, you put uh, T minus 1 on the money in government debt and T on everything else. The money in government debt are set ahead of time and then the price level follows. So, so money and government debt can affect expected inflation and therefore the nominal interest rate. So nothing wrong with targeting interest rates. Uh, and in fact, so this equation use, assumes short-term debt. With long-term debt, the government can do something like uh, an open market operation. If it, if it buys long-term debt and issues short-term debt, that can move inflation around from, from now um, to the future. So something like open market operations exist too. Now, the most important thing I want to tell you uh, on classic sort of fallacies, expected discounted surpluses, that, that goes out you know, way into the future. So people who worry about deficits and inflation, I might be the last one left, but there used to be some who worried about deficits and inflation. Um, often people who think about deficits and inflation think that the story goes like this. The government starts to run big intractable deficits and then the Fed prints up money, or the, central, or the European Central Bank prints up money to cover the deficits, and then inflation breaks out because we've printed up all the money, right? It's, it's when it happens. Well, <laughs> that's not the way stocks work. Stock prices don't decline when the company stops making money. Stock prices decline when the investors figure out that the future looks bleak. And this equation points us exactly to that uh, mechanism for governments as well. The minute investors figure out that 10 years from now this government's going to run huge deficits, inflation happens now. It doesn't wait for 10 years from now, just like stock, stock prices. I think that's an important lesson as we think about how safe are we from, uh, from, gov from, yeah, from, from fiscal inflation. 
Um, we, it's not when the actual money gets printed, it's when the investors fly away from the currency because they know what's going to happen in the future. Well, that's your theory lesson for today. Uh, let's go on and, and think about policy and think about data. So I'd like to, in turn, talk about deflation or fighting deflation and, and recessions because that, uh, at least in the US, and I apologize for my US-centric viewpoint, but that's the newspapers I read in the morning. In the US now, the Federal Reserve is, is back to worrying about deflation and recession. And then we'll talk about inflation and the euro uh, next. So let's take this idea and see what it tells us um, uh, about e exactly that, that question. So let me recap recent history here in two graphs. Recent history, uh, if you remember, uh, life was fine, and then there was a financial crisis. So there was a financial crisis. This, uh, you, this is the financial crisis, the, the big part of the financial crisis in um, uh, September and October of 2008, where you can see that, that interest, rates, uh, interest rate spreads went, this is commercial paper versus federal funds rate. The spreads went nuts. Even though government interest rates were going down, the interest rates, anybody, this is the BAA corporate rate, that's going up and government rates are going down. There's a huge flight to quality away from private debt and towards government debt. So that was the first step of, of when we saw all sorts of interesting policies happen. Uh, once the financial crisis faded, you see interest rates uh, inching up again. So the short-term rates stayed at zero, and they've been nailed there ever since. But the 10-year government bond rate in the US started going up and up and up. Meanwhile, the spreads came back to normal. So when I mean financial crisis over, I mean spreads are back to normal. And in this period here, lots of people started worrying about inflation. You see long-term government bond rates going up, massive deficits, uh, money being printed up like crazy, you start to worry about inflation. Uh, then Greece happened, <laughs> and, and ever since then, um, interest rates in the US have been trending down, and the common story is that we're back in a sort of flight to quality. People want to hold US assets rather than Greek government bonds or for some sort of flight to quality. But in, in any case, as you see, interest rates trending down, now the, the uh, the worry du jour is the worry of deflation. I can show you that as well. The same sort of stylized history here. This is the top graph is the 10-year treasury again. The bottom graph is the 10-year uh, treasury inflation protected security. So read that as the real interest rate on 10-year bonds. And the blue line there is actual inflation. So again, you see a financial crisis where the, this, so, and this, the spread between here this is the real interest rate, that's the nominal interest rate 10 years out. The spread between those two uh, is, the, um, is expected inflation. So you can see a big sort of expected deflation here. The, the tips are kind of contaminated by liquidity issues. Then as we go into 2009, really worries of inflation. Look at that, the real interest rate goes down, the nominal interest rate goes up. It looks like we're seeing expected inflation and now back down, now we're back in uh, long-term rates going down, not much happening to real rates. People are worried about deflation. Okay, so that's just a reminder of history. Now let's think about the policy issues. The policy issue is, well, what does a central bank do to fight deflation, first of all? And then we'll think about uh, what do we all do uh, if, if we return, as I think we may soon, return to a situation like 2009 when, when inflation seems to be uh, a bigger concern. So that's our, that's our question. Um, what do, we, uh, what do we do about uh, deflation or to make sure, I, I, I want to emphasize, I, we're not in deflation yet, but I think that the, I, I know from talking to people at the uh, Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is very worried about what do they do if deflation breaks out? How can they stop a deflation if it comes? And I think that's the question for us to think. Well, we have, I, I have one equation and I'm just going to beat it to death, uh, makes life simple. But let's, let's think through the menu of policy options that I know our Federal Reserve is thinking of, and I presume the European Central Bank as well. So what do you do if, if you're worried about deflation? Well, first thing you do is lower interest rates. Interest rates then hit zero, and now you're stuck. You can't lower interest rates any more than that. Now, we can have a fun discussion about why lowering interest rates works, or if it works. But however you think that happens, once interest rates hit zero, you're done. Okay, next, uh, you know, we're just reaching through the tool belt. Uh, well, that one, uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was actually, it would have been a, made a great prop. There's a screwdriver up here, you know, 
I could have thrown the screwdriver away to great effect. But on, Back to the toolbox, what do we got? Uh, quantitative easing, I'll call it quantitative easing one, um, which is something uh, our central bank, uh, the UK central bank, and, and now European central bank have all done. Interest rates are zero, but that doesn't stop us from buying more stuff. Bonds and money now have the same price, but I can, I can just keep buying more stuff, and, and um, that's exactly what they've done. Our, our Fed has done a trillion dollars, really, of quantitative easing already. But look at our equation. Now, money and government debt, we could have a pleasant argument about the differences between money and short-term government debt when interest rates are not zero. Once interest rates are zero, and especially if you're a bank, money and government debt are exactly the same thing. You don't care if you have reserves on your balance sheet or, or two-month treasury bills at, a, at an interest rate of zero. Uh, my, my favorite example is, again, with the, Fed, the Federal Reserve is not printing money. Central banks don't print money. They take in one kind and give another. So if I take short-term government debt at zero interest rate and give you bank reserves or money, that is exactly the same as taking green M&Ms and giving you red M&Ms. Now, your, your color coordination might be better, but it's not going to do anything for your diet. You're still eating M&Ms. So quantitative easing one, I can't see any reason why this is going to work once interest rates hit zero. Well, quantitative easing two. Well, throw that one out. Let's dig in the toolbox. What can we do? Uh, we can buy long-term bonds. And that is what our, our Federal Reserve is, is announced that it's embarking on. It's going to buy uh, long-term government bonds. Now, this can work a little bit. Uh, and you need a second equation that's more complicated. So I didn't want to put it up. But I can kind of describe it verbally. Um, when there is long-term debt outstanding, what the government can do by buying up long-term debt and issuing short-term debt, each, each, at each period, the price level comes from that the government has to redeem the debt that comes in. So if you buy long-term debt and issue short-term debt, now today's same taxes have to pay off more debt. So we get more inflation today. But correspondingly, the, the opposite happens in the future. When you've bought long-term debt, that debt doesn't have to be redeemed anymore in the future, so you get less inflation in the future. So at least in this framework, quantitative easing too can sort of work. What it does is it borrows inflation from the future. That's exactly what central banks say they're going to do, though they have totally a different idea in mind. We're going to lower long-term interest rates and raise short-term interest rates. Well, that's exactly by lowering long-term inflation and raising short-term. But you can see the problem. That kind of changes the timing of inflation, which can help for a while. But once all inflation, you know, once inflation, expected inflation is zero for a long time, that one's run out too. Uh, we're, we're, we're taking in, I guess, you know, different kinds of chocolates and giving out M&Ms, but it doesn't... That one runs out too. Well, quantitative easing three. Uh, the government can, can buy private debt uh, and, and give out government debt in exchange. And uh, they have certainly done that. Let's see, I've got a graph. Here is a graph of the balance sheet of the US uh, Federal Reserve. And you can see the massive expansion uh, when the financial crisis hit. These are the Federal Reserve assets. They have been buying mortgage-backed securities, student loans, uh, commercial paper, which is uh, commercial papers in this, in this brown line here, they have been buying all sorts of private debt and giving out in exchange uh, mostly bank reserves, but that is now government debt, uh, as well as some, the treasury thing here actually represents new issues of, of government debt. So you can do some of that, and, and central banks are doing some of that, but, but, and that can help too a little bit. It, you know, now, we need something like a liquidity premium, uh, something special about government debt, something that makes the discount rate of government debt go... What we want is the discount rate to go up. We want people to get rid of their government debt and start buying stuff. So by taking private debt and giving them government debt, if, if, that's, if there's some liquidity premium, that might help for a while, but eventually that too gives up. Because by taking in, we issue more government debt, but we've taken in private debt. That private debt can now help to pay off the surpluses. That runs out of steam, too. In the end, the, the problem is, uh, well, not only does it run out of steam, our, our central bank is not going to do it. Because they tried it once, and they're scared to death. And the European central bank ought to be scared to death as well. Buying private debt sounds great in a, in a seminar room like this. 
But buying private debt is, is a step away from allocating credit. And allocating credit soon gets very political. Who am I going to lend to? When I, once I'm lending directly to companies, to student loans, to commercial paper, you can see that that gets political in a hurry. And if you do that stuff as a central bank, you can't stay independent. So the central bank's independence comes from this idea that it's only really buying and selling different kinds of debt, but buying and selling different kinds of debt doesn't really do any good. So it's, it's kind of a, there's, there's everything the central bank can do runs out of steam. And I think you can see that in the latest thing they're talking about. Most of the, uh, what the Federal Reserve is talking about is, is making announcements. What we will do instead is we will announce that interest rates will be low for a long time. And uh, they're, they're now talking a lot about announcing a higher inflation target. Maybe what we'll do is we'll just say, well, we'll release to the newspapers, the Fed is comfortable with a 3% a inflation target five years from now, not a 2% inflation target. Um, so an announcement of an inflation target. Well, that, to me, you can see it on the, on the bullet point, that is a sign of desperation. It's a sign that no action you can take, you understand no action you can take will possibly work. So you're reduced to making announcements. It's also a policy that was tried once in the United States, uh, once a long time ago when I was a kid. We were worried about inflation and the Ford administration, and they handed out these cute little buttons. Uh, now, WIN stood for whip, whip Inflation Now. And the idea was that we weren't going to have the central bank or anybody do anything, but there would be a campaign of, we're going to stop inflation. We're just going to announce we want lower inflation and somehow multiple equilibria, sunspots, whatever. You got, it's going to happen. This was 1976, and you all know how well that one worked out. I have my similar doubts about how this one is going to work out. So th this uh, analysis leads you to the uncomfortable conclusion that um, uh, there is, there's a point at which the, the central bank can do nothing about deflation. Now, wait a minute, I hear you saying. You're all too polite to raise your hands so early and start asking nasty questions. Uh, I thought starting inflation was the easiest thing in the world. For example, uh, Milton Friedman often advocated, if you want inflation, just drop money from helicopters. If you drop money from helicopters, that's sure to get you inflation. How could I possibly be standing up here saying inflation is a hard thing to get going? We could have an interesting question whether it's hard to get just a little bit of inflation going. Uh, many of our Latin American friends know how to get a large inflation going. That's, a, that's another issue. But surely getting inflation going can't be that hard. Well, unfortunately, it is that hard <laughs> uh, because um, a helicopter drop, uh, remember, a central bank cannot do a helicopter drop. A central bank must always take in something to give something else out. It can't just give stuff for free. A helicopter drop of money is coded in the national accounts as a transfer payment. The way it would actually work is that, that the, the Treasury borrows money, gives it out in checks, and we have done that. The, the Bush stimulus was simply $500 checks to every citizen for, uh, financed by borrowing money. Then the central bank buys up that debt and sterilizes the money out there. But it is a transfer payment. It's an operation with fiscal consequences. And that's why it might work. <laughs> I mean, it is, a, it is a fiscal operation. And that's why the central bank can't do it. It's, it's interesting. In order to give a central bank independence, we have tied its hands from doing the one thing that could really matter, which is to enter into fiscal commitments for the government. Because you have to somehow convince people you're not going to pay back that debt if you want them to not sit on it. And even then, it wouldn't be so easy. Imagine we drop money from helicopters, but at the same time, there's a press announcement saying, by the way, everybody, so $500, every citizen gets $500, 500 euros. And at the same time, we announce, by the way, taxes are going up tomorrow by exactly 500 euros. Now, does anyone spend that money? No, they just sit on it. Even a helicopter drop only works if people understand that that money is going to sit out there and will not be taxed up in the future, that the government will, will not raise surpluses in the future to, to, in order to, to tax this money back out of the system. So what is a helicopter drop? You thought you knew a helicopter drop. It seems so simple. It's not so simple, and it's not a monetary operation. 